Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone, and um, welcome to Agri-Food Conversations brought to you by Ice-Like Fund, the Van Trump Report, the Yield Lab Institute, and Family Farms Group. My name is David Yoakum. I'm a principal here at Ice-Like Fund on our investment team, and I'm excited to welcome you to our discussion today. Agri-Food Conversations is all about driving innovation in agriculture. Each month, we highlight a specific theme, this month's theme being food ingredients. On today's call, we're joined by Derek Wells, founder and CEO of Exopolymer. Exopolymer is applying modern strain engineering, synthetic biology, and fermentation to produce a completely novel and highly upgraded portfolio of biopolymer products for use in a wide range of applications. Its proprietary strains convert commercially relevant feedstocks in, uh, via an advantaged uh, fermentation process into valuable biopolymer products at high yields, and Exopolymer controls the entire process from strain modification to performance and application testing of final products. The company's goal is to be the world's leader in design and, produ and production of next-generation tailored biopolymers that are more cost-effective and consistent. Now, each of you knows that companies are more, li more likely to succeed with the right network of customers, talent, investors, and advisors. We have invited you to this because you're some of the smartest, most talented people in Exopolymer's market. You're potential customers for Exopolymer's products and services. You have built a company similar to Exopolymer, or you have unique expertise and understand the challenges and opportunities that Exopolymer may face. Now, before we get started, we have a quick poll question to get a better idea of who we have on the call today. Please take a few seconds to answer. Um, and while that poll is running, um, a few process comments. We are not soliciting investment. This presentation is to provide information to help Exopolymer find customers, mentors, and other strategic relationships that can help them grow their business. You can use the Q&A box to ask a question at any time, and we will answer as many questions as time allows at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for replay. And so, without further delay, I am pleased to introduce Derek Wells, founder and CEO of Exopolymer. Derek, the floor is yours with eyes and ears. Okay, thanks so much, you guys. Uh, let me get my pointer going. I can find my cursor here. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to uh, tell you guys about uh, what Exopolymer is up to today. And um, thanks so much for, to Agri-Food Conversations for the invitation to speak. Um, so I'll just put it out there right away. My contact information is down here. My name is Derek Wells. Um, here is my email. Uh, please feel free to reach out after the, the presentation today if you have other questions for me that I don't cover. Uh, you can also reach us through the, uh, the website as well. Okay, so I thought that I would start uh, with a quick overview of the biopolymer market itself and that I'd like to walk through uh, some of the key points that I'm going to make in the presentation today. So the real take home here is that the biopolymer market, which has really been overlooked by recent advances in synthetic biology and precision fermentation industries, uh, it's diverse and it's very large. So these are products that, that you use really every day, multiple times every day, and, and that are key ingredients in a, a huge range of products that, that we all use. Um, you know, this market size, $30 billion, is probably a, a, a conservative estimate, depending on which market segments you, you take a look at and you, and you roll into uh, all of biopolymers. The big ones are shown here, uh, things like personal care, food, uh, materials, healthcare, and energy are really uh, where uh, we see the highest use of these biopolymers. And again, these are things that, that most of us are familiar with. Things like xanthan gum, guar gum, gelan gum, carrageenan, and alginate are the category of molecules that we're talking about today. <clears throat> From exopolymer's pr perspective, uh, there are significant opportunities that we've identified that, that we are intending to go after as a company, as we evolve. Um, our vision, I'll talk about this in a little bit more detail, is to create a platform for the customization, production of new and needed products with new performances. Today, um, and I'll show you some data on these products as well, we have over five differentiated molecules uh, with new and needed performances. The first products, it's a little bit of a departure from, uh, from food, which you folks are probably used to hearing about. Uh, we're focused on a personal care market for the first um, set of products that we'd, we'd like to commercialize. Um, and a last piece of data that I'll show you today involves uh, the second target molecules that we're focused on, which we think will, will absolutely go into food. Okay, so uh, the major companies in the biopolymer market, these are all folks that, that um, we're all very familiar with. 
What's very interesting from the perspective of a startup company is that, yes, it's a little bit daunting because you have these big players in the market. Um, what these folks are really interested in is the manufacture and production of their incumbent products. So they're really focused on the bottom line. And while there is innovation going on, the innovation is really from the perspective of taking the existing portfolio of products, blending them together, uh, and matching th those synergistic performances to uh, customer needs. So to, to illustrate the fact that this is a really interesting opportunity, uh, the biopolymer market is, is an interesting field to get into. Uh, this is just a timeline showing when some of these products that I mentioned were actually introduced into the, into the food market. So if you take a look at the big ones over here, xanthan gum, carrageenan, and alginate, to name a couple of them. You know, this was 50 years ago when these molecules were introduced into the food market. Um, and there's been very, very little. Uh, Gelangum in 1990, Curryland in 1999. In fact, I realized the other day that um, we have a scientist now in the lab who's working on our products who was born just one year before Curryland was, uh, was approved for food use. Recently, within the last decade, there's been a lot of customer and consumer trends that are going on, which are really <clears throat> interesting from the perspective of uh, the lack of performance of these incumbent products. So, you know, you all are well familiar with alternative protein. Consumers are interested in clean label, environmental awareness, biodegradability is another, another big one. So what's really interesting, again, from our perspective is that there's a big mismatch between the performance of the available products uh, and what's going on in the marketplace. Okay, so just to illustrate that even further, th there really are opportunities out there. Since we founded the company, we've been hyper-focused on identifying the market opportunities that are out there. So each one of these bullet points, and I'm not, I'm not gonna go through them all, um, represents a meeting, an email, a conversation, a telephone call with folks in the industry who have told us um, what they need and um, you know the 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 lack of performance of uh, of the products that are out there today. So, thermogelation is a big one. If you talk to alternative protein food companies, um, everybody's using methyl cellulose now, um, but nobody wants to for a variety of different reasons. So, this is a big, big need and a big opportunity in uh, dairy and alternative um, um, alternative dairy products. You have things like protein binding matrix stability, which are big needs. Uh, personal care, we'll go into more detail on that in a second. And you've got things like um, non-petrochemical derived uh, biodegradable uh, film moisture barriers for packaging, which we know are uh, sought, currently sought after by a number of different companies in that space. Okay, so just quickly, um, what are we trying to do with exopolymer? Well, um, we are, using our technology to enable the design, biosynthesis, and production of new and highly differentiated biopolymers. And here's a flow chart on the right. The details in here are not really uh, critically important for this presentation today, but what we're really trying to do is to establish the foundational data set so that we can take the basic building block materials, which are sugars, because we're talking about polysaccharide-based biopolymers, and control all of these aspects in this flow chart to get to the point where we can uh, produce uh, completely novel products suited to customer needs. So our goal here um, is to uh, design, have customers come to us, tell us what their performance deficit is, and for us to look into our portfolio and say that we either have it already uh, as an existing product or, or, or build it for you. Okay, so just to give you a taste of, of what's going on, um, right now we're focused on um, more practical uh, targets for commercial for first commercialization. Our lead products, as I mentioned, are novel biopolymers for personal care. And here's just a bit of data on those uh, products. What we found in <laughs> going through our existing portfolio of products is that we have three that are uh, that show higher moisture binding capacity than um, 
a very commonly used biopolymer called hyaluronic acid in high-end personal care products. Um, so this was really an aha moment for us and what got us uh, going towards this path of personal care. This moisture binding performance is very highly valued in the personal care industry and hyaluronic acid uh, is used broadly for this, um, really to the point where it's a hero product right now and uh, consumers are looking for this uh, on their packaging labels. What's interesting for us is that there are no other biopolymers out there that have this type of performance, a 3X performance in moisture binding compared to hyaluronic acid. Um, you know, without going into detail, our initial testing of our products in formulation show that it does indeed improve skin hydration. There are other benefits there, but we don't have time to talk about them. Um, and what I can say is that when we go and we talk to some of these big uh, cosmetics personal care companies and we show them this graph, um, they're very interested in getting their hands on this material. So this is very exciting to be in this um, in this market as a, as a first step towards commercialization and success as exopolymer. And just to drive that point home, you know, you can take a walk down the beauty section uh, of your local drugstore and you can, you can take a look at the labels and see just how many of them have um, hyaluronic acid in them. Um, and I realized putting this talk together that Estee Lauder even has a web page dedicated to describing the benefits of hyaluronic acid. So you can just read for yourself they call it a powerhouse ingredient. Um, it's, it's the perfect vehicle for hydrated glowing skin. The benefits are endless, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so we're looking at this as a startup company and it's, it's incredibly exciting to, to get into this space uh, and to try to uh, capture some of that hyaluronic acid market. Okay, so next, um, we're thinking about the future always, and you know we are doing innovation internally as well on these um, on the biopolymers we can make today. Uh, the second products that we're thinking about um, would go into the food market, um, and just briefly here, a little bit of data, um, which really proves this concept that we have of being able to modify. Uh, as David described, everything from the organism itself to the final process and purification of the product, um, these molecules show that we can actually do that. And what you're, what you're seeing here is that compared to an incumbent product, which loses viscosity after heat treatment, we have two significantly upgraded uh, derivative products uh, where, um, which go through a heating and cooling cycle and actually even gain viscosity. Um, so this speaks to that need in thermogelation that I, um, that I mentioned early on and, and is a step towards that, that goal. So uh, <clears throat> again, very interesting molecules. You can imagine that the benefits here would be for things like pasteurization, as I mentioned, thermostability, liquid handling, uh, and, and even more across food and these other market applications. Okay, so let me just end here. Um, you know, we, we're, um, we've done a lot with a little, I would say, and here's sort of the, you know, major milestones that we've satisfied along the way. We have a very robust technology platform. Um, we have commercially relevant production levels, which means high margins for us uh, at the back end. That first product and personal care that I told you about is, is really ready to scale today. Um, and uh, we've got an extensive new product pipeline as you saw from that last piece of data that I sent you, that I showed you. Um, we've done a lot of solid business development. We have today uh, an agreement with a manufacturing partner. In about two weeks, we're going to have a press release uh, on that relationship. So we're, we're tremendously excited about that. And we're gonna be starting that work fairly shortly here. We have an agreement with a major cosmetics personal care company. We are actively sampling that, that partner. Again, they saw that data that I showed you um, and they said that they wanted to test it and use it in their products. Uh, and we've had, we're in advanced discussions with uh, several other global ingredient suppliers today. Um, with regard to the intellectual property portfolio, we have extensive know-how, we have extensive trade secret information. We have patents pending for the data that I showed you today. Uh, we anticipate two to three other 
additional filings within the next year uh, based on other concepts that we have with these, with these polymers. And in terms of the validated market opportunities, there's a clear demand for innovative, uh, high value cosmetic ingredients, as I told you. And there is very strong external interest in high performance food, home care, and personal care ingredients. And, and we're sort of in a, a little bit of an awkward situation right now where we don't actually have to go out and solicit um, interactions with some of these other ingredient suppliers. They're coming to us today. And what's awkward about it is because we actually have to say no um, because we just can't do everything we want to do. So it's a nice position to be in, but you know, but we're ready to advance some of these uh, interactions with, or with more resources. Okay, so I will end there. I'd like to thank everyone who's um, helped us and sponsored us along the way, the USDA, the Investment Group of Santa Barbara, uh, NCGA, and the Consider Corn Challenge, as well as I, uh, Illinois Corn. Um, I should add lastly too that, you know, some of these, um, um, some of these folks are interested in us because of that second target that I mentioned in food. So the first personal care target, we're talking about smaller volumes um, and higher margins, but when we do connect the dots and get to these higher volume, <coughs> you know, lower priced products, that's when we, Think we're going to have a huge impact on the feedstock. So we will definitely be able to utilize more feedstock and bring value to the ag sector that way, because uh, what we're using is, is uh, corn-based sugar for the production. Awesome. Well, that's, that's it. Yep. Great. Well, Derek, really, really appreciate the overview. Um, and and exciting work and a lot of opportunities ahead for Exopolymer. Um, we do have some questions from the audience, and I do just want to remind everyone the best way to um, ask a question is to type in Q&A box, and I will answer any questions in the order that they are received. Um, the first question is, what is typical pricing for hyaluronic acid, and how will pricing compare for exopolymers product? Yeah, we thought a lot about that. Um, really, it depends on, on the, the quality level of the hyaluronic acid that you're buying. Um, we think that a, a reasonable price for HA um, at a pretty good quality level is about $1,000 per kilo. Um, we've thought a lot about this in terms of, you know, how to get into the market and how to, you know, get the right penetration as we start. We will very likely start at a lower price point than that, um, you know, just to get market acceptance at first. But ultimately, we think with that 3x performance, we could probably raise the price as people become more familiar with that product, but um, we'll probably be at a lower price point. However, what I should say is that our um, productivity right now is such that that still gives us a tremendously high margin. You know, if we were to even two thirds of, of that price point, um, we're making so much of this stuff that um, that gives us a lot of leeway there. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. I'm wondering if you can touch a little bit more on the on just like the platform itself, sort of you know thinking about perhaps other companies that are out there that are using fermentation to make awesome stuff, and you know what what makes the Exopolymer platform unique in that way, perhaps in comparison to other fermentation platforms that are out there. Yeah, I think there's a couple things. So, you know, I've spent a lot of time in this industry. You know, I started working off in biofuels and, you know, I've, I've, I've crammed a lot of genes into a lot of different organisms. Um, you know, the, the real, one of the key founding ideas behind exopolymer is to take a top-down approach. Um, you know, if my co-founder were here, she'd say that we, we use um, Olympic athletes to, to do what we're trying to do. So we're actually taking an organism <laughs> that has evolved for billions of years to make these types of products already. So that's why we're able to start with these very, very high commercial level, level titers today. Um, the organism happens to also be incredibly good uh, at growing in a fermenter, producing in a fermenter, and very amenable to molecular modification. So, you know, as opposed to building something from the ground up where you take <clears throat> excuse me, say an E. coli or a yeast, and you put a bunch of, you try to express a bunch of different enzymes in there, we're starting with something that's already really at the top and where 
you know, gently manipulating that to do the things that we want it to do. Um, and then, you know, just thinking about platforms like this, there's such a demand. You, you kind of alluded to it a little bit, Derek, and just like that there are others coming to you with ideas and you're having to sort of turn people away here. There's so much interest and opportunity in producing high value materials more sustainably with higher, with, with better performance in addition to a better uh, environmental profile or ethical profile around some of these products. Can you talk about what your prioritization process looks like in terms of how you guys go about choosing targets, given that there's such an enormous universe of, of, uh, of products you could go after? Yeah, um, you know, again, I think at this point, you know, it's, it's really from a practical perspective. Um, you know, we didn't necessarily start we really honestly started the company thinking quite a bit about food because it's impossible to, you know, not get caught up in, in the hype and all the excitement that's going on in, in alternative protein right now. Um, the personal care story really happened as I, as I described it, you know, we, we found this performance and it turns out that um, it's, it's incredibly interesting and incredibly valuable. And so that's where we're going. Um, you know, there are other benefits to being in personal care, regulatory benefits, which makes, you know, makes it attractive for us in terms of our survival as a startup company. Um, we want to, we want to be in this to win this. We, we want to continue to do this and to iterate in perpetuity um, with this technology. So it, it's also based on our survival right? We, we want to start making money as quickly as possible. Yep. Um, <clears throat> but the opportunity in food is, is massive. You know, everybody understands that. So um, it, it, I'd say it's sort of a fine balance of, of, of finding the right opportunity going after it, but also maintaining that engine of innovation and being ready for molecules two, three, four, five. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, uh, Derek, with the time remaining here, we always have to ask our guests, um, what can the audience do to help you out? Mm -hmm. here? Um, uh, what would be most useful for anybody reaching out to Exopolymer? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I thought about that. And um, I think that there are two major aspects. You know, you guys are so well connected to what's going on in ag. Um, I think that us having access to what's happening in uh, on the feedstock front, you know, having those introductions, talking to people and understanding, you know, okay, <clears throat> what's going on with corn? You know, where can I get the right feedstock? Who can make me the right feedstock? What's new and innovative um, as far as our ability to, to produce? Um, so any connections there would be fantastic. Um, I think you guys really have your, your finger on the, on the pulse of what's happening there. On the back end of things, you know, I've talked a lot about alternative protein um, food products, um, you know, we are thinking about the future. We are thinking about our survival. So understanding what's up and coming and, you know, we have, I mentioned some of the needs that we understand or that we've learned about in food, but, you know, learning what's up and coming in terms of new formulations for new food products, uh, would also be super helpful to us because then we can start to think about how are we going to tailor, make, look for our next product um, for the food market. Awesome. Well, um, Derek, perhaps uh, for anybody in the audience who heard those two requests, maybe just reiterate the, the best way for them to get a hold of you. Yeah, let me go all the way back to see if I can go back here. Um, so my email is my name. Uh, Derek.wells at exopolymer.com. You can also, there's a link on the website that uh, it's an email that goes directly to me. You can reach out to me there. Um, so please feel free to, to contact me uh, with any questions or any ideas you might have. That'd be great. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Derek, thank you so much for joining us today. And again, congrats on all the progress to date um, with Exopolymer. Um, I'd like to also thank the audience for your active participation um, and any of those listening on recording on YouTube. Uh, we host these agri-food conversations every Thursday at 3 p.m. Central Time. And if you want to share this with a friend, um, we welcome you to do so. A repo will be emailed to you in the next 24 hours. New viewers can register for agri-food conversations by going to agrifoodconversations.com. 
And if you'd like to learn more or if you enjoyed today's call, um, please join us next week um, with, uh, with Lipid. Um, Lipid's phytofat mimics the texture, mouthfeel, transfer of flavor, and cooking behavior of animal fats using the company's novel formulation and micro-encapsulation method. Derek, thank you so much for your time today. We look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you, David. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Bye.